doing? And again, if, if you um, follow us on social media, you, you kind of saw our big question already. All right, our big question tonight is this. Um, should the church cause division or unity with the world? And, and actually, there's a loaded, loaded question in that. Like, there's a lot of different ways we could approach this question. There's a lot of different ways we can look at that question. Um, and there was, there was quite a few different um, perspectives that were shared in the thread. And, and some, I mean, really, for the most part, like, it was an amazing thing. Now, that being said, should we as the church have an us versus them mentality? When in law enforcement, it's very easy to become jaded, and it's very easy to go, hey, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. Okay, we're Americans, right? So we have this mentality when it comes to everything in our life, right? Because we grew up knowing, like, Russia was the bad guys, America's were the good guys, right? Especially if you grew up in, like, the 80s and 90s. That was every movie, right? The bad guy in every movie was either Germany or Russia, and, and you know, if we keep coming into, like, the 2000s and, and late 2010s, then it became like Korea and then China and, and so on. But is this the mentality that we should have? Like, should we be so far separated from the world that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son? Like, I get it. We're, we're of the world or we're in the world, but we're not of the world. But Jesus gave his life so that all who believe will not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard if there's no one there to preach because we're so busy being separate? And that's kind of the perspective we're looking at what we're studying tonight in. So that's what we're going to think through as we jump into this. And, and we need to remember with what we're dealing with tonight, we're dealing with um, Gentiles, who have just gone through a very ugly struggle. Paul and Barnabas came to them. They preached the gospel. These people placed their faith in Jesus. They became part of the church. And then we got, but some other men came down from Judea. And these other men came down and they went, hey, look, that's great. You've done steps one and two, but this is a Jesus and thing. So unless you follow the law of Moses, you're not really part of this. Now, think about this. What, what if some people came in tonight and they were like, hey, look, that's great. Josh has been doing an all right job. He's got you guys most of the way there. But here's the deal. Unless you're ready to get this whatever, this tattoo, or you've got to wear this hideous shirt to let everyone know, then you can't be part of this. Some of us, especially those of us that take the law very, or our faith very um, convictionally, would be like, uh-oh, I got to do this too now. And so this placed a burden on these Gentiles to the point that Paul goes, no, 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 no. I'm going to go back to Jerusalem and I'm going to argue this point. So Paul does just that. He goes back to Jerusalem. He meets with the council in Jerusalem and he goes, hey guys, look, here's the deal. You guys are putting burdens on these people that they don't need to carry. You guys are making it harder to do this. Jesus, in fact, would say um, in John that anyone who puts a stumbling block in front of his little children, it would be better that they had a millstone attached to their neck and threw them into the ocean. So Paul is sitting here and going, hey, look, guys, we're putting this stumbling block in front of them. Peter stands up in the middle of the argument. And he's like, hey, you know what? I second Paul. Do you guys not remember what happened when I went and preached the gospel to the Gentiles and the spirit fell on them? God shows no distinction. God will save whoever God wants to save. Council takes a step back and they're like, you know what? You guys bring up some good points. So they come together and what they do is they, they pin this letter and they go, you're right. That's not a burden for them. And they go, hey, Paul, Barnabas, and then Judas and Silas, you guys are going to go back down, and you're going to explain to them, hey, this is what we came up with. You're going to take this letter, and you're going to go down to them. And there's a lot in this letter that we really want to jump into. The first thing we need to understand is in the greeting of this letter, in the very greeting they use a word that would have blown away the Gentiles. They go, to our 
brothers. See, we have to understand, like Gentiles in the first century, especially when it came to Jews, they were second-rate people. Like even Gentiles who would have converted to Judaism, if they went to the temple, they did not get to go all the way into the temple. They had to stop in the outer court because that's as far as Gentiles could go. Even if you were someone who went, hey, look, I have done everything you have done. The only difference between us is where we were born. They would go, that that sucks to be you, bro. That's as far as you can come. See, but now they're hearing something different. Instead of being the second-rate citizen, they get called brothers. See, we got to understand there's no such thing as a second-rate Christian. There's not. No one in this room is closer to Jesus based off of things like knowledge, like how much do you know, based off of things like how well you can keep the law, based off of things like how often you read your Bible, or based off of things like our prayer life. See, if we've placed faith in Christ, there's no such thing as a tiered system. You may be sitting here going, hey, I struggle to read my Bible. You may be be a person that's sitting here going, look, I struggle to read, period. That doesn't make you less than someone else. Just because someone can sit here and go, well, in, you know, Hezekiah 3, 7, it says, that does not make them more holy than anyone else who is in Christ, Just because someone can pray for 18 hours a day and fast all day. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with reading and studying our Bible. We should be. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with fasting, with praying. We should be doing those things. I don't know if you can look at me and tell. I don't fast a whole lot. But we do. But we just need to understand that Just because someone may know more than me, just because someone may read more than me, doesn't make them any closer to Jesus than myself. In fact, if we look back to last week, Peter said this in Acts 15, a couple of verses before. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their heart by faith. See, there's there's no distinction. And that's a big deal. Because some of us, we have that that mindset, right? That that this is what starts to develop in an us versus them mindset. Is we have this distinction that we make. I'm more holy. Because I can quote more scripture. I'm more holy because I can properly exegete that scripture. And I don't ingis with that scripture. See, whether you read your Bible every day or you struggle to read your Bible at all, the only difference between those two people is one may have a little more discipline than the other. That's it. Now, should we read our Bible? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, do you guys want to know what kicked off the Reformation? Like, do you guys want the, one of the biggest things that kicks off the Reformation is Martin Luther went, every Christian should know how to read their own Bible. Because see, back then in, in the 1590s, literacy wasn't as big of a thing as it is today. In other words, in the churches, the only persons who had access to the scripture were the priests. Well, if I'm the only one that has the knowledge and you can't get that knowledge, then what other choice do you have but to believe what I'm telling you? See, here's the thing. I, I love when people go, hey, look, you said this last week and I don't know if you're right about that. It shows so many different things. It shows A, You're paying attention because sometimes I throw things in. We have had this conversation with leadership before just to see if anyone's paying attention. 
B, it shows that you have a growing development. See, if I want to get stronger, I have to go work out. I don't want to get stronger at this point, which is why I don't go work out. But if I just went to the gym one day a week, (laughs) I would have been able to climb the tree today. But if I just went to the gym one day a week, am I going to get stronger? No. But we think by doing this just one day a week, we're going to get stronger. See, we should be reading every day. If you need a Bible plan, like you're like, I don't even know where to start. My recommendation, just start going through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Get to know Jesus. Like everything else we can work in later. But see, the first thing we see in this letter is brothers. It's sitting here going, hey, we're all family here. There is no second rate. Then they move in, and in verse 24, they said, since we heard some men came to you and troubled you. See, the church is doing, dude, you can't just put up random scriptures. The church is doing what seems so hard for so many people nowadays to do. You know what they're actually saying right here? Anyone want to take a, a stab at that one? We're sorry. Hey, we get it. These guys came to you. They put a burden on you that was not your burden to bear. We didn't tell them to come do that. We're sorry. This was wrong. We're trying to correct our actions. How mind-blowing is that? They didn't try to sweep it under the rug. They didn't try to cover it up. They didn't try to spin it to say a certain thing. They didn't get defensive with it. They went, we're sorry. We messed up. I mean, guys, if we could just start right there, do you know how countercultural that is? Especially in the day and age we live in? See, because we live in this day and age, we're sorry with, with, with admitting I'm wrong is like the cardinal sin. I mean, I may, like, make some, like, um, insinuations that I'm sorry, but I'm never actually going to come out and go, hey, look, my bad. If you, it, seriously, if you've ever been in a long-term relationship, if you're married, sorry should be second language to you, right? See, I go, just as Christians, why do we struggle with this so much? Like, everything about our salvation is built off of not us, but Christ. Like, we should understand there's nothing good in us. So it shouldn't be that hard for me to look at me and go, you know what? I'm not perfect, and I'm going to mess up. And if you ask Debbie, I'll mess up often. That's where grace and mercy come in. Because thank God, Jesus doesn't look at us and go, your name's on the board with a check mark. Do it again, I'm going to call the Father. Like, we have mercy, we have grace. Because everything in our lives should be built on, I bring nothing to this. Like, think about it, what do we bring to Jesus? What did Jesus get when you came to him? Think about it. (laughs) Yes. Like, do you think Jesus, like, ever looked at any one of us and went, got it now. We're taking the war to the devil. Josh is on the team. Dude, it ain't dodgeball, first of all. Second of all, he can do it a lot better and a lot easier if I wasn't working with him. Like, when JT helps me at the house, chances are I could get it done faster by myself. And a lot less aggravated. But you know what? I love when my son is like, Daddy, I'm going to help you. Because, again, it shows he's paying attention. And he's growing into a man. And you know what? That's a good thing. Because by the time he leaves my house, I want him to have those skills, right? But, see, we live in this society Where something happens and the first thing we do is start pointing fingers, is start condemning. 
We don't even know what really happened. We just got an update. Little red number went off on whatever social media account you are currently using, depending on your age. I'm not going to say which one I use because then you guys are going to be like, well, most of y'all know my age anyway. Okay? My Facebook comes off. <laughs> my space, yep. We see, oh, breaking story. This just happened. And immediately, like, we're, like, commenting, going. Da, 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 da. You don't even know what happened. Like, you weren't even there. It ain't even in our state. Seriously, like, think about at whatever point today when you found out there was a Chinese spy balloon flying over America. <laughs> But didn't all of us have an opinion on that already? We were like, man, dude, if I was the president, what? I'd have had that thing shot down before it even left Beijing. Like, y'all don't even know. Like, think about it. That's what we do. And we make these snap decisions, and we start pointing fingers, and we start going, you're wrong, and you're wrong. We're kind of like the opposite of Oprah, right? And you're wrong, and you're wrong, and you're wrong. See, but let's see what the Bible has to say about that. Because if we really want to be lights in the darkness, Paul would say this in Romans 12. So Romans 12 is, is this amazing, just to give you a little background on, and, and I'm not preaching all the way through Romans 12. We will eventually. But Romans 12 is this amazing, like, linchpin in the book of Romans. Okay? So if we look at the book of Romans, like chapters one through three, we can, we can like hook together and we can go, hey, these are all about you are a dirty, rotten, like dark hearted, like there's nothing good in a sinner. Chapters five through seven talk about how it is faith and faith alone that saves us. Chapters eight and nine, even 10, deal with our salvation. Then we get to chapter 12, what we see is, okay, we have recognized, we, we, are, we bring nothing to the table. We have recognized that it is Jesus and Jesus alone who has saved us. And then when we get to chapter 12, Paul starts going into this whole thing. Okay, now that you are saved, here's how you should live. And the rest of the book really covers the practicality of what it means to be saved. So in Romans 12, he starts by saying, um, be transformed by the renewing of, do not conform to the ways of this world, but, but in all things, be transformed by the renewing of our minds, right? We should be new. We should look at things with a different perspective. We should be able to see things that we didn't see before. And then when he gets down to verse 17, this is under the title heading called Marks of a True Christian. It starts with, let love be genuine. Hold fast to what is good, abhor what is evil. And then we get down into verse 17, and he says this, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. JT, leave that up for a second, though, okay? Yes, sir. Repay no one evil for evil. Jesus would word it like this in the Beatitudes. If someone slaps you on the left cheek, what should we do? Give them the right cheek as well. How many of us in this room are going, yeah, but Jesus, that's just an illustration. No, Jesus really meant that. When he says, if someone asks for your uh, tunic, give them your cloak as well, he is referring to Romans, this oppressing army that is, is just beating down the Jewish nation. He's sitting here going, hey, if they ask for your tunic, give them your cloak as well. He means that. When he says, hey, go with them, if they ask for you to go one mile, go with them too. He's talking again about Roman soldiers. He's sitting here going, hey, these people that are oppressing you, carry their stuff for them. So when we get to, to Romans and, and Paul is sitting here going, hey, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Repay no one evil for evil. Uh-oh. Because when I start looking at my life, I can't say that's what my life looks like. Because if someone does me wrong, man, I'm a hot-blooded, red-blooded American, right? That for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. I mean, that's just Newton's laws of physics. But see, if we really follow what Scripture tells us to, 
man, we look totally different than what we look like, right? We want to be lights in the darkness? What if we started with, instead of pointing fingers and condemning, we went, my bad, I was wrong. What if I own my own actions? What if instead of worrying about what you did, I worry about what I did? What if I really tried, as far as it depends on me, to live peaceably with one another? What would this world look like if I actually cared? What would this world look like if I actually loved others the way that I love me? What if, would this world look like if I actually was a light in the darkness? See, and what we're seeing here is what if the church was seen like that? What if when people thought about the church, they didn't think about all of the scandals? They didn't think about all of the, oh, they're just wanting my money. They didn't think about all of the judgmental and all of those things that every single one of us in this room can think of when we think of the word church. And I'll tell you right now, my biggest struggle in life is with church folks. Do you know that in our pursuit to find a building, we have now been like completely screwed over by four different churches? Four different churches of people who would go, hey, we believe the same thing. Like our goal is to seek and save what is lost. Four of them have went, nope, we don't want anything to do with you guys. It's not even the world. It's not even those dirty sinners that we all want to condemn. It's church people. See, and Paul isn't saying right here, he's not saying don't stand on truth. He's not saying don't stick to your guns. What he is saying is as far as it depends on you, Live peaceably with one another. Think about it. When Jesus came, he could have came any way he wanted to. See, in, in, in the Jews, the reason why the Jews did not believe he was Messiah was because they went, no, when Messiah comes, he's going to throw off the oppression of all these other foreign governments. He's going to come riding a horse with a sword in his hand. And when he comes back, that is how he's coming. But Jesus chose to come humbly. Jesus chose to take the role of a servant. Jesus chose to go to the cross. See, living peaceably is a choice. Just like living angrily is a choice. I don't know if that's a word, but it's a choice. See, what if the church was known for that? What if the church wasn't marked by division and infighting and all of those things? See, the work of the enemy is to kill, steal, and destroy. We already have the devil who does that. We shouldn't be like that because that wasn't what Jesus brought. Jesus came going, hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came to bring the kingdom back. What Adam lost in the garden, Jesus comes and goes, no, I've come to restore. See, and all we see, look around us, is division nowadays. And what's the easiest way to cause division? Create a power struggle between two different groups. Think about it. Black versus white. Right versus left. Donkey versus elephant. Secular versus sacred. Rich versus poor. This is how we have our world broke down, isn't it? Where did that come from? That's, that, that's not from Christ. Christ would pray this in John 17. That they may be all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them and that they may be one even as we are one. Why does Jesus want us to be one? so that the world can see and believe. It's the purpose of the whole book of John, verse 20, or, uh, chapter 20, verse 31. All these things were done so that you may believe. See, when we look different, 
we can see unification. Yes, Jesus does say, I came not to bring peace on earth, but I came to divide brother against brother. Because understand, the gospel can be offensive. What we believe will offend others. The world will hate us. This is all in John 14 and 15. But as far as it depends on us, like our goal shouldn't be to go to war with the person, Ephesians 6, one that is quoted many times or was quoted many times in Citigroup. We don't battle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the, the powers of darkness. In other words, my battle isn't with the person sitting in front of me. My battle is with Satan, whom the Bible already tells us Jesus beats. See, if our mission is to seek and save what is lost, how can I do that if I am trying to constantly divide? How am I doing that if I am constantly trying to be the one in control? See, being a light is going, hey, I am shining for all of you to see so that you can follow me. The reason why in Psalms, the psalmist would write, your word is a lamp unto my feet is because your word is what is supposed to guide me in life. Because if I follow what the word says, I end up looking more like Jesus and less like me. So if I want to be a light, I got to look like Christ. I got to love like Christ. And they do. They finish with clarification in this letter, right? So they go at the end, they go, hey, look, it will be well for you if you follow these requirements. And they go through this list of, of, of do not eat food, sacrifice to idols, and do not participate in sexual immorality. And just like we looked at last week, we should be correcting our brothers and sisters. To say street style, if I see one of y'all set, like I, it's my duty to come up and be like, hey, look, how you're living is wrong. Not with those outside of the church, but with those inside the church. For good reason. Why do you think in this letter they go, it will be well for you? We looked at that last week, right? That we were given the law so that we know the boundaries to operate in. Because I'm pretty sure Debbie wouldn't like it if I had other girlfriends. So therefore, do not commit adultery. That way my marriage goes as smooth as possible. It's already hard enough to be married, let alone adding in other people. See, we correct not because we have to be perfect to earn our salvation, but because that we have our salvation, we now have the ability to say no. Again, going back to the book of Romans, Paul would say you were either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. Those who are dead in their trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2 says, I don't know if you've ever been around dead bodies, but they don't do anything. They kind of just stay in the same position they died in. So if I'm dead in my trespass and sin, I do not have the opportunity to not sin because I am a slave to sin. But see, when I've been set free, that word salvation in the Greek is actually the word soteria, and it means to be delivered from. What am I delivered from? My sinful nature. I now have the ability to recognize this is wrong. That's why we don't condemn those who are outside of the church. Because they don't have that ability. The Spirit has not illuminated their heart and mind. That's why Paul would say, going back to Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because every one of us that has placed faith in Jesus, every one of us that has sat here and went, Jesus is exactly who he claims to be, we know when we're wrong. And what the church is doing is going, hey, hold fast to these things. This is all that's required of you. Because there is a cost of discipleship. That's what the whole point of Luke chapter 19 is. Chapter 9, not 19, my bad. 
Jesus would say this, if you do not pick up your cross and die daily, you cannot follow me. We've wasted way too much time going, hey, just accept the free gift of salvation. It wasn't free. Jesus paid for you. And the cost was high because it was his life. See, our mission to seek and save what is lost, in order for us to complete that, we cannot have that mentality. Is it us versus them? This is what we do, right? It's sacred in here. These are sacred things. Out there are secular things. Jesus didn't say, hey, I gave my life for only the sacred. Jesus, and in, 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 not Jesus, Paul in Romans would say that all of creation is groaning. Because when Jesus shed his blood, it was sufficient for all creation to be redeemed. This is why Jesus would tell Peter, and going all the way back in Acts, when Peter has the vision of the animals coming down, Jesus tells him what? Do not call dirty that which I have called clean. Thank you, Jesus, because that put bacon back on the table. Not one amen for that. Okay, obviously y'all ain't had like a good smoked pork butt. (laughs) See, we cannot have the mentality that is the church versus the world when Jesus uses the church to save the world. It is our mission to seek and save what is lost. So unless we believe that the spirit is done saving... Honestly, if that's what we believe, then awesome. We can just hang out in here. Because there ain't nothing for us to do out there. But if we believe that God is still spending, or, uh, sending his spirit to save, then we can't be about division. We can't have an us versus them mentality. It has to be a compassionate, mercy, and grace-filled Jesus has sent me on a rescue mission to seek and save what is lost. So as we close tonight and Josh comes back up, JT, put up that last slide. There's just three questions I want us to end with and I want us to really think about as we're thinking and and, and closing out. Question number one is this. Am I bringing unity or division? Which one am I all about? Am I about having conversation? And I'm not saying don't have tough conversations. Absolutely. We need to have those. And sometimes what you believe is going to cause division. But is my goal to create unity or division? Understand, you can't control how other people are going to respond to what you're saying. And let's be honest. Some people are not going to like hearing the truths that you're going to share. But is, is, what is your heart behind it? Is your heart behind it to show how awesome we are and cause division? Or is my heart behind it to, to have just one more repent? So am I bringing unity or division? Do I look at the world with compassion or contempt? Am I looking at the world going, I don't even care. Y'all, y'all make me sick. Look at your behavior. Or am I looking at the world going, we are dead in our trespasses and sin. And they need Jesus. They need the gospel. And lastly, what is one thing I will do this week to be a light in the darkness? Realistically, what is one thing? That's not asking a lot. You got seven days to come up with one thing to go, hey, here's how I'm going to point people to Jesus. So, Father, as we close tonight, we just ask and we pray that, God, the weight of your world, uh, word be on our heart. That, Father, we are transformed from the inside out. That, Father, we go into this week on mission, hoping and praying, God, for compassionate hearts to see those around us. Father, we ask and we pray that, God, you give us courage and boldness to be your witness, to seek and save what is lost. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.